So good to see you in the house of the Lord today. Thank you for being here. And thank you for joining us online or by broadcast. We welcome you as part of the Rose Heights family, and we're glad you're tuned in too. You know, the Lord has been good to us, and Jesus is amazing. But I'd like for us to consider this question today. Since Jesus was fully human and fully God, did he ever experience anxiety? This series, Breaking Point, has taught us that emotions can literally take us to a breaking point, especially in 2020. You know, the staff and I were talking, we were thinking that 2020, the phrase 2020 is going to take the place of the phrase um, Murphy's Law. Like when you pull up or when you walk up to a line that's short and it turns out to be the longest line, you're going to say, this is so 2020. <laughs> or when somebody's crazy and they're just going nuts, you're going to say, these people are just 2020. <laughs> or when you're feeling all uh, angry at someone and you just want to let them have a piece of your mind, you're going to give them a warning by saying, I'm about to go 2020 on you. <laughs> it's no wonder that in January of this past year, I announced that our theme for 2020 was the Holy Spirit. God knew. He knew that we need the Holy Spirit in 2020 because it certainly isn't by mind or by power, but by His Spirit, says the Lord. He knew that the Holy Spirit is the only one that can give, give us guidance in a state of confusion and the only one that can give us peace amongst turmoil. He is the Holy Spirit, and we love him so much, and he is real. In this breaking point series, we have discovered that worry will lead to fear, and fear will lead to anxiety. So what do we do about that? Anxiety will literally take us to a place of breaking. But here's the good news. I need you to preach it with me again. Come on. When we reach our breaking point, the Holy Spirit gives us a breakthrough before we break down. Now I want you to preach it like you really mean it. You knew I was going to do that, right? You just hold back the first time because you wanted me to do it. You want to do it again, all right? Preach it with me. When we reach our breaking point, the Holy Spirit gives us a breakthrough before we break down. And that is so true. I'm so grateful. But how, how does he do that? Well, he does it through the Word of God. You see, the Word of God says, do not worry in Matthew chapter 6. It says, do not fear. In Isaiah chapter 41 and it says do not be anxious in Philippians chapter 4 now if God gives us these commands then there must be a way to obey them God wouldn't give us a command unless we could obey it so we've got to understand that the Holy Spirit gives us the power not to worry not to fear and not to be anxious but it's through the power of the Holy Spirit that he does that. And it's through the illumination of God's word that we are reminded of principles that can help us navigate through all of the confusion of 2020. For the next few moments, we're going to look at the scriptures and what it has to say. And I'm going to ask you three questions. But now I want you just to pray with me. And I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to open up your mind and your spirit to realize things that you already know and to give you instruction on how to have that supernatural peace. Would you pray with me? Lord, we come to you with this thought in mind that your word is alive, that your word has the power of life, that the Holy Spirit has been sent to this world to reveal your truth your truth through the word. And so, Father, for the next few moments, open up our minds, 
Open up our hearts to receive your word and help us to grow. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. First question. Who are you following? Are you following some politician on Twitter? Are you following your best friends on Facebook? Or people that are your friends that you don't even know? Are you following famous people on Instagram? Are you following news feeds that continually pump information into your mind? Are you following YouTube conspiracy theorists? Every single day, some new conspiracy comes out. Who are you following? Here's another way to ask that question. Whose disciple are you? Are you the news media's disciple? Are you YouTube's disciple? Are you Facebook's disciple? Are you social media's disciple? Now, all of those things are good in and of themselves. They can be bad, but for the most part, in moderation, social media, news, etc., can be very positive and helpful. As a matter of fact, if it weren't through Facebook, you would be watching this today except on our live stream. So all of those things can be good. So I'm not saying that those things are bad, but what I am saying is this. If you spend more time allowing those things to influence you and you are consumed by them, then you are their disciple. Think about that. Psychiatrists tell us that people who are addicted to their iPhones or their uh, Androids can't leave them alone for 10 minutes if they're in the room. Every less than 10 minutes, they will pick up that phone and just look at it. Sometimes they scroll through something. Sometimes they click on something. Sometimes they just pick it up without even thinking about it and put it down. It is a source of comfort. It is what they are familiar with. And so it bears answering honestly this morning. Whose disciple are we? What are we consumed by? If you are the disciple of Jesus Christ, then you have come to the right place at the right time. The world needs you. The world in 2020 needs a true disciple of Jesus Christ because if you are a true disciple of Jesus Christ, if you are consumed by Jesus Christ, if he is your greatest influence, if you spend time with him every single day, then the world needs you. Look at what Philippians chapter four has to say about you. Rejoice in the Lord always. Really? Even in 2020? <laughs> He's writing from prison. He's writing from a prison that he had to pay rent to be in. And he's telling people to rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice in the Lord always, even in 2020. Again, I say rejoice. Let your, here, here it is, let your gentleness, let your presence, let the peace of God that flows in you and through you be known to all men. If Jesus Christ is your Lord and master, if you are his disciples, if you are following him, you should be able to walk into a room and the room calms down. The very presence of Jesus Christ in you should make a difference wherever you go. People should see something in you that causes them to ask this question, who are you following? And your answer is Jesus. If you're following him, you should have that kind of presence about you because the Lord is at hand. The Lord is near you. If he is your master, he is walking beside you. He is in you. He is influencing you. You speak with his words. You look through his eyes. You touch with his hands. You are his disciple and you make a difference in this world. That's what he's calling us to do. Second question. How are you praying? Look at the next verse. Be anxious. That, that literally means don't be torn apart. Anxious means to be torn literally to shreds. It means to be pulled apart. It means that there's 
a battle going on in your mind and you can't focus and you can't be effective or productive and it's causing you to just lose sight and you're in a state of confusion and you're experiencing an anxiety attack. It's just so overwhelming. This, this is what the Apostle Paul was saying. Don't be anxious for nothing about anything. Really. If it were not possible, he would not have said so. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. How are you praying? May I suggest that some people pray like God is a genie? They wait until they have this crisis. They wait until they've tried everything that they can possibly try. And then finally, they go to God and they lay out all of their problems. And they just spew their problems to him. And when they finish talking, they feel better. And that's kind of like a therapeutic prayer. It's like a religious ritual where you go into the presence of God and you just lay it all out there. Then you feel good about yourself because you've done something religious and you've checked off the prayer thing and you can walk away and God is trying to say something to you. He's trying to build a relationship with you. He's trying to, 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 to enlighten you to his word and, and you don't even wait. Man, isn't that easy to do? That is so easy to do. We get so caught up in the things of this world and the busyness of life that we wait until we're about to have a breaking point before we go into God's presence. But may I suggest two things. May I suggest that you start using a pattern of prayer. That is, that you pray consistently and persistently and that this pattern of prayer includes the following. Like the Old Testament prayers. And the New Testament prayers, when they would go into the presence of God, first of all, they would proclaim his person. They would say how great God is and who is God. He is the creator and sustainer of the universe. They would just talk about how wonderful the person of God is. And then they would remind God of his promises. Then they would bring their problems to him and then they would praise him. Take Jehoshaphat, for example. He was having an anxiety attack because he was about to be killed. I mean, really, who wouldn't, right? We're not throwing stones at people that have anxiety attacks here. Jehoshaphat was having a serious anxiety attack because he was told that tomorrow four nations or three nations are coming against you and they are going to attack you and wipe you from the face of the earth. How did he pray? He went before God and he proclaimed the person of God. He said, God, you are the God of Israel. You are the God who made all things. And then he reminded God of his promises. He said, God, didn't you say that we would live to be a blessing on this earth? And then he presented his problems. He said, God, these people are coming against me. We gave them mercy back then and now they're coming against us to destroy us. And then he praised God because he knew that God was going to honor his word. When you go before God with that pattern, it is going to be an effectual, fervent prayer that avails much. When you go and you say, God, this is who you are. This is what you've said. This is what I have. And now I'm going to praise you. Listen, if we'll just do that on a daily basis, that leads me to my second point. I want you to Pray proactive prayers. Don't wait until there's a crisis. Pray when there's the worry stage. Remember, worry brings fear, brings anxiety, brings us to a breaking point. Pray when you're just worried. Create a new prayer list for tomorrow. Write down everything you're worried about. Write it down. That is now your prayer list. Take that prayer list to God and proclaim who God is and remind God of his promises as you read your worries. Remind God of his promises. For example, if you're worried about paying the bills, you go in there and you say, God, you are the God who owns everything. I'm just a steward. All that I have belongs to you. You are a God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Here's my worry, Lord. 
I'm worried that I can't pay the bills, but remind him of his promise. But you said in Philippians chapter four, verse 19, but my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. This is what you said, God, and I believe your word and I believe you're true and I'm gonna praise you in advance before the answer even comes. Now that's an effectual prayer. Pray those kind of prayers. You know, Jesus said in Luke 18, he said this, He said, we ought always to pray and not be faint of heart. Not we ought always to pray after we fainted. We need to pray before we faint. But a lot of times we pray after we faint. And what sense does that make? So how are you praying? In the context of anxiety, How are you praying? Here's the last question. What are you thinking? Look at the criteria here. Verse number seven. And the peace of God. (laughs) Now you have faith to have the peace with God, don't you? You believe that if you confess your sin, that God was faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So now you have peace with God in that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Jesus comes back. You're going in the rapture. You have peace with God. That is amazing faith. But with that same faith, you can believe that you can have the peace of God. That's not just a cute spiritual phrase. What that literally means is that God's peace is your peace. Let's think about that for a second. Is God up in heaven thinking, oh man, it's 2020. I knew this, I knew this year would come. I'm so worried. I'm worried about all. No. God knows the beginning from the end. He's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. God's not worried about 2020. He's not worried about tomorrow. You can have that kind of peace, the peace that knows that everything is going to be done as God has decided. You can have the peace of God, which surpasses understanding. It doesn't make sense to the world. You walk into a room, you've got this peaceful persona, an incredible presence, and somebody smarts off to you and says, why are you so happy? (laughs) Haven't you heard the news? Don't you watch the news? Haven't you read all the things that are going on? What makes you so happy? It's the peace of God. It's the presence of God that passes understanding. Yeah, we are informed. We know what's going on. But we also know that God is in control and it passes the understanding of our very minds. It'll guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Here's the criteria for what you're going to think. Are you ready? This is crazy. Listen to this. It's what you should think. Finally, whatever things are true and whatever things are noble and whatever things are just and whatever things are pure, And whatever things are lovely and whatever things are a good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate or think on these things. Man, if that's true, we don't have anything to think about, do we? Except one. There's only one thing in this entire world that meets that criteria. Here it is. Think about the word. When you face anxiety, meditate on the word. Get in this Bible. Make sure that you memorize it. Make sure that you meditate on it. Make sure that you chew it up like an old cow chewing cud. Get it deep within your spirit so that when the enemy comes against you, you just spout out even without thinking the word of God. You walk in the word. You live in the word. You meditate in the word. This is your answer. This is what we should be thinking about. I get that we have lives and I get that we have jobs and I get that we have relationships and all those things, but God forbid that we go through the entire day without thinking about God's word. Man, if we could just do that. 
So, question. Did Jesus ever experience anxiety? Yes, he did. He had an incredible anxiety attack. And how he dealt with it gives us three simple practical ways of how we can deal with anxiety because you can't avoid it, but you can deal with it. Follow him to the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane literally means crushed. And we find this these three practical things that Jesus did when he faced anxiety. First of all, he confided in his friends. Mark 14 says, they went out to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And Jesus said, sit here while I go and pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him, and he became deeply troubled and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here. And keep watch with me. The son of the living God, fully human yet fully God, confided in three very close friends and told them, fellas, I know I looked like I had it all together in the upper room when I was saying, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. I know I looked like I had it all together when I said, in this world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world just a few hours ago, but right now, I'm telling you right now, I am so crushed, I am so heavy, I feel like I'm gonna die. Jesus confided in his friends this very difficult and heavy truth. Here's my point. When you're having anxiety in your life, do you have that friend or friends that you know that you can go to and tell them what's going on in your mind and in your heart and you know that they won't judge you. You know that they will be there to compassionately be with you. Do you have that friend in your life? If you don't, may I encourage you to cultivate a friendship with somebody because we are created for community. We are not created to be alone. We are created for community and we have to have people in our lives. We have to have that friend that we can go to when things are falling apart and just be able to share our innermost thoughts and tell people that I'm being crushed right now. I feel like I'm being about, about, about to die. And we've got to have that kind of friendship in our lives. Here's another question. Are you that kind of friend? Do people trust you with confidential information? Are you trustworthy? Are you someone that people can share their deepest, darkest secrets with and you won't judge them, but you'll pray for them and be with them? God is calling us to be a community of believers that can be trusted. And we've got to cultivate those kind of friendships because we can't walk in this world alone. Jesus tells us in this experience that we need friends that we can confide in. Secondly, Jesus communed with his father. Look at this. He walked away a stone's throw, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. He prayed more fervently. He was in such agony that the, of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of of blood. There's a medical condition that I won't go into that says when someone is in, under extreme stress or anxiety, that blood literally comes through the sweat pores. Jesus was having an incredible anxiety attack in so much that he cried out to his father. He cried out to his father and he said, God, I know I know that we planned this before the foundations of the world and that I was the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world. But God, I've never even sinned. And now, hold on a second. Some people say, I think I could deal with anxiety and stress if I just knew what was going to happen tomorrow. What if you did know what was going to happen tomorrow, like Jesus? May I submit to you that if you knew what he knew, you'd be more stressed out than you are. God saves you from knowing the future. 
Jesus knew the future and listen to what he continued to say. I've never even become sin. I mean, I've never even sinned and now I'm going to become sin. They're going to beat my body so bad that the prophet Isaiah said about me that I won't even be recognized as a human being. I'm just going to be a, a piece of flesh on the cross. And it's going to be painful physically, emotionally, because everyone's going to reject me. It's going to be painful spiritually because I'm going to become sin in so much that you are going to pour out your wrath on me. And I'm going to take upon myself the penalty of all the sins of all mankind for all, all time. And there's going to come that point where you're going to turn your back because I'm literally going to, going to become sin. And I've never been separated from you, Father. I don't know what that's like. Is there any other way? that we can do this that we didn't think about? Is there another way? Do I have to bear this cup of suffering? He knew the answer to that. And he said, nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. Here's the beautiful thing. When you confide in friends, then you have a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You can go into the very presence of Almighty God, into the Holy of Holies made possible by the finished work of Jesus Christ, and you can pour out your soul to Him, and you can tell Him anything and everything, and He's going to look at you with great compassion. He may not deliver you out of the fire or out of the storm, but what He says is, I am going to walk it with you. I'm going to walk with you, and I will be there. You will feel my presence. Commune with your Father, your heavenly Father. Thirdly, he confronted his foes. Look at this passage. Leading priests and Pharisees had given Judas a contingent of Roman soldiers and temple guards to accompany him. Now with blazing torches, lanterns, and weapons... They arrived at the olive grove. Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him. So he stepped forward to meet them. Who are you looking for, he asked. Jesus, the Nazarene, they replied. I am. The word he is in italics. He simply said that same phrase that God said when Moses was at the burning bush. I am, Jesus said. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with him. As Jesus said, I am, they all drew back and fell to the ground. This is what happened. Simon Peter was ticked off. He wanted to protect the Lord. After all, he said, I will die with you. So he drew his little sword. And he attacked Malchus of the Roman, I mean, of the, of the, the chief priest's guard. When he did that, Jesus, with compassion, healed his ear and told Simon Peter, put your sword up, Peter. Like, do you not know that I can call 12 legions of angels? Another way to put that is, do you not know that with a snap of my finger, I can call 72,000 angels to defend me? One angel in Isaiah killed 186,000 people overnight. What could 72,000 angels do? Jesus had at his disposal enough power to do whatever he wanted to do. Yet he chose to confront his foes not with power, but with love, with forgiveness. These are the same people that he would cry out, Father, forgive them, for they do not, do not know what they do. This is the same person that betrayed him, that Jesus washed his feet Jesus confronted his foes with supernatural ability to maintain self-control and to give mercy and grace. Who has caused you anxiety? Who has stressed you out? And what is your response? Your response is to confront them, not in this world's way, but in God's way. And only the Holy Spirit can help you do that. You deserve better, and they've hurt you, 
But through the power of the Holy Spirit, you restrain your words and you restrain your actions by the power of self-control given to you only by the Holy Spirit. And you lavish on them unconditional love and mercy and grace and compassion. That is what makes a difference in this world. That is how we address people that cause anxiety in our life. That's, that's hard. You can't do that in and of yourself and neither can I. But God has given us the power of the Holy Spirit and he will help us. Would you stand with me, please? What are you facing? What kind of anxiety are you going through? Confide in a friend. Cry out to God, your father, who loves you. And confront your adversary with supernatural ability that only the Holy Spirit can give you. So, last week... With the power of our words, we confessed who we are in Christ. This week, with the power of our words, we are going to confess who Christ is to us. It's with the power of your words that you were saved. It's with the power of your words that things happen. Words have life. And in just a moment, we're going to do a responsive reading as it were and that I'm going to say he is and you're going to say something else and it'll be on the screen and I want you to say it with passion like you mean it because the enemy is listening to the power of your words and by the time we finish this list of who Christ is to us you will go out of here full of victory you will go out of here full of peace and anxiety will have no place in your life because you will be victorious because Jesus Christ is your Lord. Now the first service didn't have as many people in it as this service did, but they shouted. Don't you dare let them outdo you. What I'm basically saying is simply this. Say what you believe and say it like you believe it. These are powerful words that we're about to speak. And those of you who are at home or by broadcast, watching by broadcast, you can say it right where you are. And God's going to hear your proclamation of faith. Who is Jesus Christ to you in this 2020 world that we're living in? Are you ready to make a proclamation of faith? Are you ready to say what you believe and say it like you believe it? All right, here we go. He is the Alpha and Omega. Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. Jesus is the bread of life. He is the bridegroom. He is the chief cornerstone. He is faithful and true. He is the good shepherd. He is the great high priest. He is Emmanuel. He is the Lamb of God. He is the light of the world. He is our hope. He is our peace. He is our redeemer. He is our rock. He is our savior. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the door. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He is the word. He is a wonderful counselor. He's the mighty God. He's the everlasting father. He's the prince of peace. He is the great I am. Give praise to him this morning. Hallelujah be to God. That's who he is. Father, we thank you that we have peace with God. Just keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Is there anyone in this room or listening by broadcast or online that you don't have peace with God? You're consumed with all the events of this world. It's a confusing, confusing time and God wants to give you supernatural peace. He wants to give you peace with Him. He's in control, but is He your Lord? If you've never cried out to him and asked him to be Lord of your life, here's your opportunity. All you have to do is believe with simple childlike faith. Just confess your sins and he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And with a simple childlike prayer, you pray, God, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I'm so confused in this troubled world and I need peace. But not only do I need the peace of God, I need peace with God.
I need the assurance to know that if the rapture were to take place, that I would go to be with him. I need to know that if I were to die right now, that I would be in his presence. I need to know that I'm right with God. I need peace with God. So please forgive me. Write my name in the Lamb's book of life. Give me eternal life that you promised through Jesus Christ. I receive it. I accept it. Now, Lord, help me to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Help me, Father, and help me to be a disciple. Thank you, Lord. Now, Father, we thank you for peace with God. We thank you for the peace of God. I pray for this congregation. I pray that, God, you would lead them to follow those instructions and that you would relieve them of anxiety. Give them the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit to live in this 2020 world that we're living in and be a light. In your precious name, I bless them. Amen and amen. Do you love him, church? Amen. He's good to us, isn't he? Would you quote the scripture with me, would you please? Love one another. As I have loved you, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love, one for another, even so come Lord Jesus. God bless you.